and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. I'm excited about that. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. You remember God's word today in the name of Jesus. During Easter season, like this, we celebrate the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And to get the full idea of the resurrection in the Bible, you will need to read Matthew chapter 28, Mark chapter 16, Luke chapter 24, and John chapter 20. The death of Jesus and his resurrection was so important that it was documented by the four Gospels. Another historical event that happened in the Bible, there were some that were recorded by Matthew that were not recorded by John. There were some recorded by John that were not recorded by Luke. But when it comes to the death of Jesus, because it is the centrality of what Christianity rests upon, it was documented properly by all the gospel writers. And in this season of Easter, we are celebrating Easter globally. It is not just being celebrated in Kenya alone. It is not just being celebrated in government alone. It's a global celebration whereby we remember the most powerful event that ever happened in human history. In fact, to me personally, people should lay emphasis. You know, in the world today, we lay more emphasis on celebrating Christmas. Am I right? When it is time for Christmas, everybody is up in arms. We want to do it in a great way. But when it comes to Easter, we say it's just Kidogo. Imagine, Jesus died on the cross. He was buried and he never rose. It was his resurrection that gave meaning to his death. Had he died and he was buried without resurrecting, then you wouldn't have been here today. The only difference that Jesus made is that he died like any other religious leaders. But by the grace of God, he rose powerfully from the grave. Nobody has ever done it before his time and nobody ever did it after his own time. Jesus died and what? And he rose. So, Christ Jesus, by rising from the grave, conquered the grave. The attempt by the religious leaders of his time to keep him in the grave could not materialize. They didn't want him to rise. They chose soldiers. I think about 16 of them. The Bible called them four qua, quadri, what? <laughs> eh? The four of them, that's four, four soldiers each. So they, they appointed them that they must be in charge of his grave in order to ensure that this Jesus, who was a liar, and who is a liar, who lied to his people, that he will die, and on the third day, he will resurrect. So they wanted to prevent a resurrection story from happening. They did everything possible, but thank God, he rose. Let somebody say, Jesus rose. Let somebody say, Jesus rose. There are many believers today who have known and have celebrated the cross, but they have not known the power of his resurrection. Although the two events, the death of Jesus and his resurrection, are talking about two, about one singular personality, the person of Jesus. But in the realm of the spirit, there are two different dimensions 
that God wants believers to operate in. It is not just a story to be told. It is a life to be experienced and to be lived out. Are you listening to me? It is a life to be experienced and to be lived out. So we are not in a history class where somebody is telling us that somebody died about 2,000 years ago and he rose. No, it is more than that. It should be experience. It should be an experiential thing to every believer. So there are so many Christians who have known the power of the cross, but they have not known the power of the resurrection. There are two different dimensions. The cross is a spiritual dimension and the resurrection is a spiritual dimension. The cross is a revelation of God's love to us. But the resurrection is the manifestation and the revelation of God's power to us. So the cross is about the love. That is why the Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So the cross is the revelation of God's love to humanity. But the resurrection is the power of his resurrection. It's about power. Let somebody say, resurrection is about power. That was Paul. That's why Paul said that, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. It is possible to get to the cross and never experience the power of resurrection. Imagine Paul was saved in a dramatic way. He saw light from heaven. He heard the voice of heaven. Jesus himself spoke to him. And after many years, this man even went to the third heaven. He heard what normal human beings could not hear. He went to the first, the second, and the third heaven. And he came back to say that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. He got to the cross and accepted salvation. But he said he still wanted to know the power of his resurrection. Listen to me. When Paul said in Philippians 3.10 that I might know him. So this revelation about the power of God is known or explored through the power of knowledge that I might know. That means the knowing is progressive. That I might know him. Paul has known the power of the cross. He probably has known part of the power of resurrection he said but I might know him damn it it is a thing that is explored by knowledge that means it is possible to be in a church yet you have not experienced the power of resurrection he Paul who had the voice of heaven on the way to Damascus could be saying that I might see know the power of resurrection damn it the resurrection is deeper than what we think about It's not a story to be told. It's a life to be experienced and to be lived out. So it's possible to experience Christ's dimension. It's just like a human being who has two sides. You can know this part of me, but you know the other side of me. It is possible for a Christian to know Christ's dimension of the cross, but yet... They have not experienced Christ's dimension of power, which is made available through resurrection. So today, we are talking about the power of his resurrection. So according to Paul, knowing this resurrection power is made available through the knowledge of God. You have to keep knowing him, knowing him is an adventure. How you know God this year should not be the way you know him next year. You should be progressive in your knowledge of God. Because when you stop growing in your knowledge of God, you start dying. So the quality of your Christian life is predicated on your depth and understanding in matters of Christ's resurrection. Please don't forget that. The quality of your Christian life is predicated on your depth and understanding in matters of Christ's resurrection. So we need to know the power of his resurrection to enjoy 
deeper relationship with God. In order to become a holy nation. God's special possession. And those who declare the praises of God in this dark world. According to 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, chapter 2, verse 9. So Christianity is not a religion that is based on abstract principles. Did you hear me? Christianity is what? It's not a religion. You know, when we get to school, anytime I say, or oh, you are seeking admission, or you are looking for a job, they write religion. What do you normally write? Christ so I'm not happy because I know it is not true. So Christianity is not a religion. Let somebody say Christianity is not a religion. Hey, let somebody say Christianity is not a religion. Have you realized that? There are so many religious leaders in the world. Christianity is the only one that is different. In other religions, the persons they are worshipping don't live inside of them. It is only in Christianity that they worship them is living inside the worshiper. I am not just an ordinary person. That's why the Bible says, He that liveth in me is greater than he that is in the world. That means that you are not just alone. Jesus is living inside of you. You are bigger on the inside than you look on the outside. Let somebody say that. I am bigger on the inside. I am bigger on the inside than I look on the outside. That is why witches cannot try me. If there's any witch here, please go and conduct me and come and meet me. 1,000 witches cannot stand this small boy. Why? Because greater is he that liveth in me than he that lives in the world. So in Christianity, the worship is living inside the worshiper. Muhammad is not living in the lives of Muslims. Buddha is not living in the life of Muslims. Joseph Smith is not living in the lives of Mormons or the members of the seven, they call them what? Latter day saints. But I know they are lying. It is only in Christianity that they worship. Is living in the worshiper. That is why if I want to call on God this morning, I don't need a prophet to, to assess God. Where I am right in my room, on my bed, even right in the toilet, I can say, good morning, Jesus Christ. It's inside of me. It's not outside of me. It's inside of me. The resurrection of Jesus is at the heart of the Christian message. Did you hear what I said? The resurrection of Jesus is what? It's at the center of the Christian message. Without resurrection, we have no message. Did you hear me? Without resurrection, we will have a mere religion. It is the resurrection that gives quality to our Christian message. That Jesus died about 2,000 years ago and he rose. So we are not serving a dead God, we are serving a living God. It is quite unfortunate that the church services stress the empty tomb or resurrection story only on Easter Sunday. It's pathetic. In fact, it is not an event to be celebrated once a year. It's an event or a life to be lived every day of the year. Easter should be an everyday thing. Not a thing we put on our calendar and we say, and next month, April or March, that is Easter. No, it's a life to be lived experientially by every believer. It is not just an event to mark on our calendar. It's an experience that every believer must celebrate every day. That Jesus died and he resurrected. Without, without the resurrection, Jesus' ministry will have ended in defeat and disappointment. Without it, one can only pity Jesus as a dead Messiah whose lofty ideas were sadly misunderstood. Many believers have only come to know Jesus' power, but not the power of his resurrection. There are people that have known about resurrection academically. They know it in their head. Jesus died about 2,000 years ago. And he rose from the grave. Our Jesus is not in the grave. They know it academically. 
but they don't know it experientially. It's a dimension of power in the realm of the spirit that you have to connect yourself to, that you have to live out that life. That when people see your life, they know you are not serving a dead God, you are not, you are not serving a dead God, you are serving a living God. Many of us are living our Christian life as if Jesus is in the grave. Tell somebody, Jesus is no longer in the grave. Hey, it's like these people are here this morning, they are the ones who are alive. Jesus is no longer in the grave. Some of them are woken up. Jesus is no longer in the grave. I don't know your own Jesus, but my Jesus is no longer in the grave. I'm serving the living Jesus. So don't be living your life as if your God is dead. Don't be living your life as if Jesus is still in the grave. Jesus is alive. On one hand, there are so many people who believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead. But on the other hand, they are not manifesting this resurrection power. It's an abnormality. You need to know it that Jesus died and resurrected. But you also need to believe it, to live it out practically as if your Jesus is alive. There should be a difference between those who are serving a dead God and those who are serving a living God. Our Jesus is no longer in the grave. Say your Jesus is no longer in the grave. Hey, Bolly, my Jesus is no longer in the grave. And as we celebrate and praise with the choristers today, may God manifest his resolution power in every faculty of your life in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. So if you celebrate Resurrection Sunday once in a year, you are missing out. God's mandate for you is for you to live and to walk in the resurrection power every day of your life. So quickly now I want to see the significance of his resurrection. Significance, the significance of Jesus' resurrection. Why is his death very significant? Number one, it demonstrates that we are serving a living God. I am serving a living God. His name is Jesus Christ. He died and rose and gave me victory. I have victory. The story of resurrection, number one, demonstrates that we are serving a living God. We are not spiritual orphans. Our father is not dead. Tell yourself, I'm not a spiritual orphan. <laughs> ah, say yourself, I'm not a spiritual orphan. <laughs> My father in heaven is alive. No spiritual or religious leader has ever died and risen from the dead. Only Jesus did. Guatama, Buddha, the founder of Buddhism, died and he got rotting in the earth. If you get there today, you can still find his bones. Many people have traveled to Jerusalem and they said when they got there, they showed them where they buried Jesus. The grave is empty. The emptiness of the grave is a proof that your Jesus is alive. When Muhammad died, he was buried. He never rose from the dead. When Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, the leader of the seven, I mean the latter day saints died. He got rotten in the earth. He never rose. Death held them captive. And death is still holding them captive. Only Jesus went to the grave and resurrected. So Jesus' resurrection proves that he is God. He does not only dwell in heaven. He lives by his spirit inside of you. He can help us when we have problems. You can't talk to a dead God to help you. I pity African traditional religion. They make certain God, Osanyi, Ogun, and many others that they worship in Yoruba land. And I know you have your idol, you worship in Kenya. You make the idol. The Bible says, they that made them are like them. So they go, they pour libation, and they bow down to them and say, deliver me, oh, 
Some people are coming to fight me. I love what this man did. What is his name? Jeruba. Gideon. You remember the story of, of Gideon? When he went and he destroyed the bar, uh, the, 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 the idols that the people of Midian were worshipping. He went and he scattered them. <laughs> and they came. They said, we know who must have done it. They told his father, bring out your son. We are going to deal with him today. His father told them, he said, if he is God, why are you fighting for him? Let him fight for himself. Because they are dead God. But the God we are serving is a living God. Say your God is a living God. That means, if you are serving a living God, he can answer your prayers. A dead God cannot answer the prayer of his adherents. It's only God. That's why you can wake up in the morning in your house and say, good morning, Holy Spirit. As I go out today, be with me. That means he's no longer in the grave. Had it been that he was in the grave, you wouldn't have been able to pray to him. So our Jesus is alive. And when he's alive, whenever you go through challenges in life, he can help you. Are you going through marital problem? He can help you. Are you going through financial problem? He can help you. Are you going through the problem of barrenness? This same God can help you. What does the Bible say? In the book of James, chapter, is it James? Yeah, sorry, Hebrew. Hebrew chapter 4, from 14 to 16. It says, see then that we have a high priest. Our Jesus is a high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all ways tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. A needy God cannot help needy people. Did you hear what I said? A needy God cannot what? Cannot help needy people. Our God has no need. That is why he can meet our needs. It's possible for you to come to me and say, Pastor Emmanuel, I have some need. I need 10,000. If what I'm having is 200 bob, and you need 10,000, I will say, I am needier than you. You know, when we say people are needy, there are categories. Needy, needier, neediest. But thank God we are serving a God who has no need. Let somebody say, God has no need. So because he has no need, he can meet your need. So you need someone who has no need to meet your need. The Bible says, in the time of what? We obtain mercy and grace to help us in the time of need. That has been made possible because Jesus is alive. If you are serving a living God, it shows it can answer our prayer. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, it was an unprecedented event. Nobody has ever gone to the grave and risen before. But before he went to the grave, he made a promise. At the time, he told his disciples, he said, look at this temple. How beautiful it is. He said, it shall be destroyed and on the third day, I shall build it again. He was talking about his body. So many promises were made in the Old Testament pointing to the fact that Jesus would die and resurrect. He himself made a lot of promises that he would die and he would resurrect. Remember, nobody has ever died and resurrected. Even Lazarus, who died, he didn't resurrect. Jesus raised him. But nobody raised Jesus. He said, he said, my life belonged to me. So I gave it and I have the power to take it back. So he went to the grave and on the third day, he resurrected. If he fulfilled the promise of his resurrection, then every promise he has made to you, he can fulfill them. Now, look at it this way. Please look at me. Between the promise of Jesus dying and resurrected, and resurrecting, and the promise of giving you financial breakthrough, academic breakthrough, which one looks seemingly impossible? This one is small, am I right? So, if you fulfill the seemingly impossible promise of dying and resurrecting, whatever he has promised to you, he can do them. He can fulfill them. He can fulfill them. I don't know the need you have this morning. But as you celebrate the death and the resurrection of Jesus, yours might be in the area of biological fruitfulness. Maybe you have a health challenge in your body. Or you have need financially. Or you have need, you have been praying for lifting and promotion over the years. 
Because you are here today on this resurrection celebration day, the Lord shall release those blessings to you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Number two, it gives us power or it gives us victory over Satan and his demons. It gives us victory over Satan and his demons. If Jesus had not risen from the dead, demons will have been ruling our lives. It was his resurrection that made our authority possible. So the resurrection of Jesus guarantees our authority over the devil and over our demonic forces. When Jesus died and was buried, all the hosts of hell, they did everything to keep him in the grave. Are you still here? When Jesus was in the grave, the Roman you know, power, the Roman authority, they did everything. They put soldiers there. They put a big stone that no human hand can remove. They put it at the grave. They say, this one will make sure that the disciples don't come to carry him so that the, 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 the latter story will be worse than the first one. So they made sure that the place was intact and they put soldiers there thinking that by doing that, Jesus will not rise. <laughs> the host of hell, they had a meeting over there and they decided, let's ensure that Jesus does not rise from the grave. But because resurrection was and is still authentic, they failed. They could not succeed. You can see that in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. First Corinthians chapter 2. Somebody will experience resurrection power in this meeting today in the mighty name of Jesus. I say you will experience resurrection power today in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, can we read? I'm not hearing you. Huh? Now you are reading as if you are in your kitchen. Read as if you are in the church now. Welcome to church. Can we read it? But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. That means his resurrection was a mystery. Something that is not known. Yes? Even the hidden wisdom, not just wisdom, but hidden one. Yes? Which God ordained before the world into unto our glory. Which none of the princes is talking about demonic powers. Princes of this world ever knew. For what? For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That tells us Satan is not omniscient. There are so many things Satan doesn't know, even concerning your life and destiny. You know, some of us, we, sometimes we, we are too afraid of the devil. We say, ah, maybe the demonic power, they know who I'm going to become in the next 50 years. Tell yourself, tell somebody by yourself, demons don't know everything. <laughs> tell them, demons don't know everything. The Bible says, had they known it, they wouldn't have crucified. You know, one of the failures of the past of darkness, if Jesus did not die, there would be no you. It was his death and resurrection that produced you. That can make you to come before the altar today and say, I confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life. Why? It was his death and resurrection. If they knew that God planting one seed will produce billions of children for God, they would have left him alone. They said, let him if I remain, remain here for one billion years so that he will be in heaven alone with the angels. No sin to be. But they didn't know it. It was a mystery that was hidden. From the foundation of the earth. The first thing Jesus gave us after his resurrection was power. Say after me. The first thing Jesus gave me after his resurrection was power. You see that in the book of Matthew 28, 18. Matthew 28, 18. He said, the first, he said, and Jesus came and spoke unto them, 
saying, All power in heaven and on earth. So his power was given to him, not for him, but his power was given to him for us. Oh, it's like these people are not here this morning. His power was not was given to him, not for him, because he didn't need it. He, you remember, he was God in heaven. He was God in heaven. So this power was given to him for what? For us. That means if Jesus was given every power in heaven or not, he has given you every power in heaven and earth. Hallelujah. And what is exceeding? Let's read also the next uh, text. Ephesians chapter 1. This one is confirming about the power that Jesus has given to us. We are not ordinary people. Oh, tell yourself I'm not an ordinary person. <laughs> I am not an ordinary person. I am God's power engine. Can we read? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? To us, word, who believe according to the working of the mighty power, which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand and in the heavenly places, far, let somebody say far, let somebody say far. Hey, let somebody say far. Far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is ever named, not only in this world, but to Jesus. This is the power that Jesus deposited and delegated to you at his resurrection. Far above principalities and powers. Listen to me. The Bible says that we wrestle not against blood and flesh, but against what? Against principality, uh -huh. against powers, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Spiritual what? Wickedness in heavenly places. Listen to me. Geographically, demons are above us, but spiritually, we are above them. That's why the Bible says, I will put Satan shortly under your feet. That means the highest place Satan can reach in your life is under your feet. He can't even reach your knee. The, the highest place they can, you know, sometimes when you don't know your right, that's why you fear demons. Demons don't deserve your fear. Anytime you fear the devil, you have wasted your fear. Because he that fears God has no one else to face, to fear. Are you here this morning? He that fears God has no one to do what? To fear. It is better to even fear rats than to fear demons. Can I tell you what? Satan is more afraid of you than you are of him. I think we share an addition, we go. Satan is what? You know, every time you enter your room and KPS it takes off power and you are afraid. And you and you hear rats. Even you hear this thing that I cry, you think they are demons that have come to visit you. This cricket, it's, you see demons in there, and you, you say, Ah, no, I don't know. They have come, they have come. You don't know who you are in God. I know who I am. I'm walking in power, I'm walking in miracle. I know who I am. I'm walking in power, I'm walking in miracle. I live a life of favor. I know why. Can you sing the rest now? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, I sing his glory. Where, Brauchi? Ah, I will send it back to Nigeria. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I sing his glory. Oh, I know who I am. I'm walking in power. I'm walking in miracle. I live a life of hey. I know who I am. I'm walking in power. Oh, I'm walking in miracle. I live a life of favor. I know who I am. Your greatest and biggest weakness is not to know who you are. That's why the devil challenges you every time. He wants you to forget who you are. That's why the Bible says, when you read the book of 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 18, 
the greatest weapon the devil has is roaring. He makes your little problem to look as if they are big. Whoa! It's a toothless dog. Let somebody say, Satan is a toothless dog. <laughs> have you seen some dog that they have removed their teeth? And they say, oh, 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 oh. If you don't know the teeth have been removed, if it, the claws and the teeth have been removed, his teeth and the claws were removed on the cross of Calvary. He said, the son of the woman would do what? Who bruise his head. So Satan bruises the head of the devil. It's a toothless dog. It's a clawless lion. He has no. So the Bible says what? He goes about roaring like a it's not, it does not even qualify to be a wounded lion. It's only roaring like them. Some of them sometimes we paint the devil. You know, you go to some churches, they will make the devil look at look bigger than God. They talk about devil, devil, devil. You see that you are saying, Where is God there? How which is the head is big? They even talk about demons that are not existent. They say there are some demons. They have 21 ears. Where? They make the devil to look more than his. I love the story of this man of God that I had. They said he was in the house one day, and they say he was here. Somebody he was upstairs. Somebody was scattering some things in his sitting room. I'm talking about real life story that was documented in a book. So it, it was in the middle of the night. He came, he was ready upstairs. So he came down. When he got to the sitting room, they said he saw the devil physically. You know, Satan cannot appear to some of you with that idea. When you see the horn, they say he has horn. I've not seen it. So the man he said he saw the devil himself in the sitting room. <laughs> you know what he did? Uh, he said, the man is. I don't know how to ease. Women know how to do it better. They say, he said, I didn't know it was you. I wouldn't have wasted my precious time coming down to look at you. He said, let me go back. He said, the, the head started spinning. So I'm too insignificant that this man cannot even command me in the name of Jesus. He doesn't command the command. He doesn't deserve the command. He just, he said, I didn't know it was you. I wouldn't have come downstairs to waste my precious time. Let me go back. Have you ever decided to fight somebody and the person is looking at you as if you are not making sense? It pains you more than the Levite. So, has it ever happened? We say, we are, we are going to kill ourselves today. He said, uh, okay. It's painful. You know when you go to somebody, you abuse him and abuses you. At least your this thing is coming down. He said, I will finish you today. I will kill you. I destroy you. And he turned back and he's going as if you have made no sense. Ah, that was exactly what Naban did to the devil. Satan does not deserve your fear. Every time you fear the devil, it is a wasted fear. It's better to fear rat. It's better to fear tortoise than to fear the devil. Let somebody say, Satan does not deserve my fear. Let somebody say, demon does not deserve my fear. Because he who fears God has no one else to fear. So spiritually, we are above the devil. Geographically, they may be above us because they dwell in the heavenly places. But the Bible says that we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. That means spiritually, we are above the devil. Satan cannot destroy your business. Satan cannot threaten your life. Satan cannot threaten your marriage. Because what? You sit far above principalities and powers. When Jesus rose from the dead, he left hell in shambles. He left what? I want us to read this verse. I love it. I love this verse. Colossians chapter 2 verse uh, 15. Colossians chapter 2 verse 15. Shall we read? Yes. Please make sure you read. Uh -huh. And having spoiled, I'm only hearing this simple. It's like there's a greater anointing here this morning. What is happening to this? Did you don't pray for your children? Yes, can we read? And having spoiled, uh -huh. principalities, uh -huh. powers, uh -huh. he made a shield of them openly triumphing over there. I used to celebrate this verse. And I now went to message version. When I saw it, I started dancing in my house. Now let's see message version of this. Colossians 2, 15. I think you have it there, Baba. Yes, can we read it? <laughs> let's see what it says. Uh -huh. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants and one more time, touts. <laughs> have you ever seen those touts? Who are calling 
Uh, you know when I first came to Kenya, they used to call it. Uh, uh, ta, 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 ta. Uh, what they call it? Ta. Tao, tao, tao. So I was tao. What is tao? Tao, 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 tao. I didn't know they were saying tao. I was saying tao, tao, tao. What is tao, tao? Sometimes I will wait. People will be going. I say where are they? Wait. I don't know where. I say I'm going to town, but it's calling tao, 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 tao. Those boys, many of them, they call people inside the vehicle. They are not going nowhere. When they give them twenty bomb, they come down. You will not be a tout in the kingdom of the name of Jesus. This is a spiritual tout. Who hire passenger for the devil in his matatu to hell fire? Tyrant. They call them demons. But this Bible called what? He said they are tyrant. Now, read again. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority. Uh-huh. At the cross, I march them. Match them what? Naked through the streets. Sir, you are a big man in the street where you live. God forbid that one day it will not happen, it will happen to your enemy. Now, what happened? The moment they see your nakedness, your pride is gone. Even when you wear clothes, they say, I, We saw the boot talk yesterday. <laughs> oh, it's like you don't understand. Oh, Jesus, thank you for message, Basha. He said, What? Well, Go strip them naked in the street. Who have been stripped naked? Can they, can they threaten your life? Can they threaten your marriage? Because in the street of heaven, they are born born and they opened yesterday. And you sleep in the night, you say they are coming. Who is coming? Resurrection power is dead in you. If it's alive, demons cannot threaten you. Let someone say, demon cannot threaten me. Let someone say, demon cannot threaten me. Because Jesus I strip them naked. The power of his resurrection. The power of his resurrection. The power of his resurrection. I think I, I should stop there. Another day I'm going to preach it. I want us to praise God today. Celebrate him as if your Jesus is alive. Let heavens know that you are serving a risen Lord. As to press him to that Davidic way. When David was pressing God, he never thought about the people around him. He was pressing God and he forgot everybody around him. Please, as to praise God today, don't try to be nice. Don't do what? Oh, don't try to do what? Imagine a king was rolling on the floor. Was he thinking about his people who are looking at him? A king? No wonder the wife said, you are, you are a ridiculous king. Don't be nice. Don't be civilized when you are praising God today. If God says, roll on the ground, please roll on the ground. If God says, jump like a Maasai, jump like a Maasai. Don't be jumping. Maybe the other people, they say, jump. jump. What is jumping, Kiswali? Wiley? <laughs> eh? Eh? Ruka? 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 Ruka, and you are doing like this Ruka. because uh, because Sister Judith is doing like this, and uh, who again, Sister Anne, they are doing like this, and your head is high. You say, no, they will think I'm mad. You are not doing like that. Ruka, Ruka, is this Ruka? You are not Ruka. You are chini. You are not Ruka. Don't be nice today when you are praising God. So praise God today. God will disgrace your adversaries. You will experience the resurrection power. Everything in your life that has not been working, as you celebrate Him today, they will start working in the mighty name of Jesus Christ.